complicated. You know, man, it's like a damn Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man, then you get to one side, then like man. All right, Black Horse, welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. We got our first snowfall of the year here. So, uh, you know, reminds us we're in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think your definition of what a snowfall is and mine are very different. Like if we get white powder on the ground in the south, just all civilization comes to an end. Like, you yeah. Know. Well, we got about th we got enough on the ground so that my kids could make a snowman this morning. So, you know, it was an okay snow snowfall. Yeah, I was about to say, that's probably the ideal amount, it, at least where I live, because I'm, I'm closer to the mountains, so we get a little bit more. But there are probably, our, our really big snow every year will be between, we'll get one that's anywhere from like, you know, maybe like five to 10 inches. And the yeah. world just stops. You know, everything <laughs> shuts down for a few yeah. days because no one knows what to do. And then yeah. other than that, we might get like one or two, but it's, you know, it's really rare. So, yeah. but I know what you mean, like when you're a kid, it is like, a, it is a magical thing. Well, you know, the, I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a you know, one-and-a-half-year-old at home. And uh, they woke up this morning and just sat in front of the front window and stared at it um, <laughs> until they could get breakfast and get out there and enjoy it. Um, so, you know, that was great. I know that, and look, like, I don't have my own children, and I know that they always say, like, oh, every age is the best age. But that, like, the, the children that I really just enjoy spending time with you know, like it, you know, teaching Sunday school or, or anything is that is that kind of like perfect window between like four and 12 years old, you know, where you're like large enough that it's like, oh, like we can actually like go outside and do something. Yeah. You know, and like you can take care of your needs. Right. Yeah, exactly. But I don't have to worry about you like, you know, sincerely just hurting yourself by, if I turn around. But that's also the age where, you know, things like sledding and snowball fights are incredibly fun. Yeah. And at least for me, like that not to sound in any way like I don't know, like childish about it, but like there's something just really fun about like kind of reliving that, you know, that joy in, with children. Yeah, it's more fun than I ever thought it would be. Um, so that I, I've really enjoyed being a father. So if we could, before we, you know, launch into that, could you just kind of describe, you know, who you are and what you do in these circles to everyone at home? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I operate under the alias the black horse uh the the horseman of the apocalypse the bringer of inflation and, sh and food shortages uh i created my twitter account uh shortly after the 2020 lockdown uh, in order to catalog what i expected to be an avalanche of inflation uh you know we've gotten some i, I think we'll probably get more before this is all done uh and i publish in two places primarily um uh, you'll see me over with Lambda on the Lambda Bible Studies channel doing uh, religious content. And you'll see me with Radlib every other week doing Econ Minis, which is a current events and economics show. Yeah, I, that's that's how I I found you first was through Radlib stuff because you know, we were kind of joking around to uh, at the beginning of this that, uh, you know, I, I myself have a finance degree and all I've gotten through my degree is a complete and total distaste for the subject. <laughs> uh, yeah. But and so my point in that is not to just you know complain about about school, but it's to say that it, it takes quite a lot for me to see, you know, financial material in my my off time, so to speak, yeah. and actually like get something out of it, like want to spend more time listening to it. And your your econ minis with with Radlip are great. I, I I can't recommend them enough. Yeah, well, I will say that I have a little bit more than just a, a finance degree. <laughs> no, I'm so, aware, I'm aware. Yeah. <laughs> You're an actual, like, real professional. Um, but yeah, I, I did that. Uh, I, I quite enjoy working with Radlib, and I really recommend the content he puts out on, on his channel more broadly. Uh, I think there's there's some real learning opportunity there. So I uh, go over and, and take a look, uh, watch some of my stuff, watch some of his stuff. It'll be worth your time. So anyway, I, I, there are a few things that I, you know, I know about you in addition to your work, which is one, you know, you're Canadian. <laughs> and, yes. And, and there are a few, you know, Canadians, like I got into a big conversation with, with Gio about this. And I will say I'm kind of fascinated by Canada to a certain degree, because in many ways, you know, growing up in kind of a purple state, you know, and like living in a lot of, you know, blue American cities there's always this continual threat anytime, you know, a Republican governor, mayor, president wins that, oh, I'm, I'm going to move to Canada. 
You know, like that's the thing they always <laughs> threaten. Yeah. And, and it and buried within that, you know, that kind of like silly idea is this preconception that America or that Canada is just per, is just essentially a Democrat forever version of America. So if you could, obviously, I'm not trying to, you know, make you speak for your entire nation, so to speak, but how would you describe the relationship between, you know, Canada and America in a, in a political sense? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. So there are a few things you should understand about Canada at the outset. Uh, Canada has historically been two nations glued together artificially, and now it's probably more like four nations artificially glued together. Um, so when you speak about Canadian politics, uh, typically people will speak about the portion of the Canadian political elite which have been in power for a very long time. So, for example, the Liberal Party in Canada was in power more years in the 20th century than the Communist Party was in power in Russia. So it, there, there definitely is a, an inner party that has dominated Canadian politics for a very long time. And when people talk about Canada's political identity, that's what they're talking about. But it's important to realize that what you're looking at there is you're looking at the dominant coalition in the nation you're not looking at a complete description of the politics of the, of the nation. And so you have this, this ruling coalition that really invented the Canadian political identity in the 1960s. And they invented it as progressives set up in opposition. They set up the, Can the whole non-British Canadian identity as in opposition to Red America, which is why progressive Americans always kind of, they look at it like some kind of fantasy land because every dunk that they're trying to perform over Red America right now that they're kind of struggling to get over will be gotten over in Canada as a way to signal that we're better than Blue America at dunking on Red America, even though Red America isn't in our country. So, so two things. First, uh, your mic is peaking a little bit. So can you just maybe adjust the gain a little bit or step sure. back? It's, it's not bad. I just want to address it before I get, you know, 10,000 comments about it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing, and it's interesting you bring that up because I kind of became aware of this, this pattern. And look, I haven't been, you know, just by virtue of age, you know, politically active for a particular, you know, a particularly long time, but I was kind of aware of this the cycle, the one that you mentioned of, you know, Canada kind of almost seeing, seeming to kind of perform massive feats. You know, like the ones I think about are a lot of, you know, kind of like the big, you know, Trudeau, Trudeau, uh, Trudeau Jr. rather, yeah. you know, projects like the, uh, everything that happened with COVID, you know, and Trudeau or what happened with, you know, the, the, the things that he's been doing around, you know, firearms regulation in Canada. Yeah. All of which, from the outside looking in, seem incredibly like drastic and incredibly sudden. And look, I realize like I don't follow Canadian politics, but and, it does. And not seem only like... that, but not driven by events inside of Canada, right? Yes, and that's the that's the last one I wanted to bring up is that in many ways it does kind of seem like this is almost a you know a bizarre I guess political party that's. Because I think all of us in the West are suffering with this problem, where our political parties are not interested in serving. They're, 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 they don't have skin in the game, right? They're not really yeah. serving us. You know, it's a wider problem. But it is almost odd to see a a political organization run to spite people who don't even live in the same country. Yeah, that's like, right. it is just an odd. And this pattern goes back a long time before you were politically engaged, right? So at the same time, the Defense of Marriage Act was being passed in like 2004 by, by the Bush administration. We were legalizing gay marriage in order to dunk on the red Americans who don't live in our country. So you say that that started sometime in the 60s. Was that kind of a, a response to, to Nixon? I realize mm, he was you know, a little bit on the later end, or was it response no. to some kind of previous cultural force? So if you look at the history of Canada, um, Canada is, in the 19th century all the way up until uh, the First World War is like the most pro-British empire place that has ever existed on the planet. Um, so when the Boer War occurred in South Africa, uh, the Canadian government couldn't afford to get directly involved. And so a private citizen named Strathcona 
uh, donated money in order to raise a horse regiment, sail them to South Africa, and fight in the war, and then sail supply them on his own dime there and and sail back. So you have this like really profoundly pro-imperial um, culture at the time, and this culture takes some really really serious body blows in the first and second world war um canada spent the most per capita of any nation uh in the in the second world war and uh lost a, a huge number of people in, in the first world war and the consequences of that in canadian politics filtered through as a circulation of the elites from a a set of pro-British elites to a set of pro-American elites. Um, and the response there is partially out of the trauma of the First and Second World War, but also partially, uh, you know, the British Empire ceases to be a political force um, through which elites in Canada could kind of make hay at that point. And so they're left with this really strange situation in the 50s where Canada is now kind of a, a vassal property of the United States instead of Great Britain. It's got this weird British imperial identity that no longer makes any sense. And so there's this project that uh, I, I read a book when I was an undergrad called The Invention of Canada. And it's very much what happened in the 19, late 50s, 1960s, where you had almost a cultural blank, blank slate because the previous identity was attached to a, an organization that no longer exists. And so if you were inventing a country in the 1960s, um, well, what ideological force would you as an elite attach yourself to? Well, uh, there's only one at that time, right? You, I mean, you could, I suppose you could be communist, but um, you're going to pick out, you're going to pick up on the the ideology of the in-group ruling the United States. And so we got, um, we had all three major political parties adopt progressivism, make up a national identity uh, that was founded in progressivism and carried with it the progressive blood feud against Red America. So if you could, could you describe what is this, new origin myth like the post 1960s canada what is that i guess you know version of kind of your to use it a really like you know chin stroking term like your ethnogenesis so to speak so uh you would if you go to canadian public school sort of between 1970 or well we'll put it a little lighter between about 1985 and about and as far as i know up to today you'll get textbooks with titles like Canada, a nation of immigrants that will adopt the racial diversity story, the civil rights story as the founding myth of Canada, uh, that Canada is kind of this um, progressive project that magically came into existence in 1867 and has been um, defining its identity by declaring rights to to more and new groups of people ever since that, that's well said so i'm curious because within a lot of these you know progressive movements there there's kind of if we can assume the kind of tired analogy of, as of progressivism as a as a religion the original sin you know the 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 thing that must be fixed by progressivism Right, the 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 thing that distances you from, you know, progressive God it, in the U.S. is slavery. Yeah. You know, it, it. What is kind of the original sin of old Canada and you know your version of progressive religion? Well, for a long time, our original sin was Red America committed slavery. Um, so like when I was a, a public school student in the '90s, we learned about how uh, Canada was. You know the real end end point for the underground railroad um which is of course like completely complete nonsense um to the extent that the re the underground railroad is a thing the vast majority of people who take it just end up in northern states and there's like a handful that ever reach canada but nonetheless this is something that we learn about um 
we learn about uh, and you you learn a little bit at that stage. We were just making the transition to talking about the uh, great evil that was done by Canada in uh, colonizing the lands that once belonged to, to Native Americans. So this is you'll see this in the modern Canadian obsession with doing uh, Native American land acknowledgments before like every public event. Um, so now if you go to like a, a good Canadian progressive event, you'll have like three of these land acknowledgments of all the native tribes that once might have possibly owned the land you're presently standing on. Um, which is doubly like insane because Canada has almost a uniquely cooperative his historical relationship with Native Americans compared to, you know, almost any other colonial project, you know, ever. But it, it, um, nevertheless, this is this is a, a deep part of how how this country is governed. So, are there still old Canadians? Like, are there still pockets of Canada that kind of subscribes to the the previous like political myth? Well, so what you have in Canada is. Uh, a couple of different nations sitting on top of each other. So in French Canada, you have an unapologetic ethno state. Um, they believe they sort of, they use the French language as a very thin stand in for race. Um, and they unapologetically believe that it is uh, deeply important that French Canadians uh, occupy all positions of institutional power within the province. And, you know, it would also be good if you could enforce that on the rest of Canada to some extent. So that that's one people group that you have. Uh, you have the, you, you have the people group from which the Laurentian elite that dominate the country kind of come from, which is the Anglo Canadians. And the Anglo Canadians have been going through the pro project of sort of self hatred for much, much longer than uh, their American brethren. And they've started to kind of almost die out. Um, you notice in the United States that progressives have this problem where they don't breed and they kind of have to induct the the children of red America into progressivism in order to survive. But what happens if there's no red America from which to draw? Well, that's a really big problem. And it's a problem that the Laurentian elite kind of have here. And they've tried to solve this problem with successive waves of mass immigration, uh, which have created a couple of other nations within Canada. Um, so uh, you have our version of Red America, which is extremely small, is the sort of the old Anglo uh, kind of reformed and and uh, even mainline Protestant religious people. And there's like tiny fragments of this world left. Um, it's been destroyed in a way that Red America can't kind of imagine itself as having been destroyed. And then there's uh, the broad culture, which is this sort of imagine it as like the 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 Californians kind of standing at the end of their own history because um, there are no children of of Red America for from for them to adopt really, um, and they don't have any children of their own, and so they're you know they're having their moment, but the future looks kind of bleak. And then you have this fourth nation, uh, which is, well, you might subdivide it a bit, but there's a huge South Asian community that has taken root in, in Canada that has their own sort of political representation and their own communities that are, you know, significantly isolated from uh, the broad culture. So like if you if you turn on the radio in Toronto, you'll find they've got radio stations. If you wander around at the right time of, of year, you'll find 
places where Diwali lights are extremely common. So there are like these communities that have taken root in Canada and they're large enough now that uh, they're almost a peer to some of the other nations in Canada. Hmm. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because that's, I haven't been to Canada, you know, incredibly often. I've, I've mostly interacted with, with French Canadians who are a, a very bizarre breed. I'll just put it that way. Uh, I didn't really have a mental category for that type of person until I met them. Uh, I'll just put it that way. Yeah. But that was one of the things that I did notice is that the, the South, the Southeast Asian population and the Indian population is huge. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it was something that I had just not really considered until I'd been there. Well, yeah. So Canada had through the eighties and nineties, a system that was, uh, points based in immigration. And one of the ways you could get points is if you spoke English as a second language. And of course, huge parts of India and Pakistan, because of the history of British education there, uh, learned English as a second language in school, which meant that they were privileged when attempting to get access to Canada as an economic migrant. So over the course of the 80s and 90s, we import, these people came here on, an, on a vast scale. Um, there's a similar phenomenon for the sort of elite Chinese uh, who, ha who come to Canada to buy property um, and hide from the CCP. So uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is that I would say that, you know, broadly across the West, you know, we're, we're, we're all becoming, you know, less and less, you know, religious as time goes on. Would you see, would you say that Canada is a, is a kind of a post-Christian society or is there still kind of a strong religious presence? Uh, so I think that this is a misunderstanding. Um, so Canada's dominant religious tradition since the 1960s has been progressivism. Some of those people who were progressives used to call themselves Christians, but they were always progressives first and Christians second. Uh, and you can see this in their churches. Canada is the, the capital of rainbow flag waving churches, right? If you see a rainbow flag outside of a church, you know that that is not in fact a Christian church. That is uh, a community association for progressives. Um, and Canada is filled with these, these places. Canada does have uh, a set of extremely radical religious minorities uh, and has for a very long time. Uh, some of these were imported like in the 19th century. And some of these are like a remnant of the period of time when um, because Christianity was kind of the emblem of was, was the state religion of the British Empire. There was, you know, uh, a lot of opportunity to build institutions at that time, and some of those institutions survived progressivism. But the vast majority of them just became progressive institutions when the politics changed in the '60s. And so, I don't think it's appropriate to describe Canada as post-Christian. I think it's appropriate to describe. Canada as the dominant religion here is progressivism and progressivism in the last 30 years or so has moved on from tolerating actual Christianity to kind of actively persecuting it. That, that's well said. I think you really hit the nail on the head there. So tying in, you know, several previous themes all at once, I, I kind of have this, and maybe this is a symptom of being a, you know, a rabid, you know, news addict is that I have this kind of like deja vu or this, like, like this, this feeling like, wait, I've been here before. And it, it occurs where I kind of remember these scraps of kind of like the news stories of yesteryear, you know, like the really big, like momentary, but like incredibly attention grabbing stories from, you know, two, three, 10 years ago. Yeah. And so I was driving down the road the other day, thinking about something completely unrelated. And I kind of had this thought, it's like, wait a minute. Wasn't there supposedly this giant mass grave in Canada? <laughs> yeah. And no one ever heard about it again. It yeah. looked like maybe it was a bigger story in in you know Canadian news 
or at yeah. least the resolution of it was. But I'll put it this way. These are this is my remembrance of an old news story. So correct me if I've got anything wrong. Yeah, so this is a really important piece. So you, you talked about we talked earlier in the discussion about how the founding myth of, of Canadian progressivism kind of moved on from the anti-slavery na narrative to the anti-colonial uh, narrative in which Canada was excessively mean to Native Americans. And one of the key elements or one of the new sacraments that was adopted in this, this view uh, is the annual observance where we remember that a series of mostly liberal governments uh, had uh, an intentional program of cultural assimilation uh, aimed at Native Americans in which they would send the RCMP or other police to Native American reserves to round up Native American children and send them to boarding school. Um, some of these boarding schools were secular, some of them were, were run by the church, and they, Native Americans had to live there for, you know, whatever period of time you have to be in public school. I, I don't really remember through the history of it. And, you know, you have a, a whole collection of children from, a, from low status, separated from their parents with nobody to advocate for them. And so, you know, abuse was rife in these institutions. Um, Canada only stopped doing this in the 90s. Um, so this kind of thing sounds to outsiders like it's ancient history, but in Canada, it's not so ancient. Um, and so uh, I guess it was in 2020, um, some researchers claimed that they had found mass graves outside one of the residential schools in, in BC. Uh, this incident sparked a series like almost like the, the the summer of the great awakening in the u.s uh we had our own version of this where you know every public school child went tied an orange ribbon on the on their on the fence near their school you know those progressive churches all left little pairs of shoes and and children's toys on the front steps to remember all the children who were supposed to have died in this way well it turns out a year later what they really saw were tree roots and there were no bodies at all. Jeez, that's that's just um, grim. And but there are a couple of really interesting uh, items here. First of all, uh, you had this like mass moment based on like nothing. Um, but despite the fact that it's based on like nothing, uh, every year in I think it's. September or October, we still have this ritual where all the public school children performatively remember the the, the kids at the residential schools and like tie an orange ribbon on the, the, the fence or put an orange flag up uh, as the, the symbol of, you know, why we hate ourselves for doing this in the past. And we had a series of, um, I think it was a hundred churches that were subject to vandalism uh, characterized by efforts to burn them down. We had I think uh, a half a dozen that were actually burned to their foundations um, in a moment that our prime minister described as understandable. Um, so very, very much a, a parallel of the sort of the summer of Floyd. It's interesting you bring that up because to me, I've always felt like, and forgive me for being you know dismissive here, but I've always kind of felt like Trudeau was kind of bargain brand Barack Obama. Because <laughs> I don't know if you remember when when Trudeau first came on the scene, this was still when kind of like Tumblr bedroom feminism was really big. Yeah. But like the the American progressive left fell in love with Justin Trudeau. Yeah. You no, know, he's so dreamy. He's so charismatic. You know, he's so great. And, and kind of similar to the love affair that I think a lot of progressives had with Barack Obama. And despite the fact that I think, especially on, you know, just by virtue of being around for so long, the luster has really started to wear off on, on Trudeau, at least, you know, from this side of the border. But to me, at least like that, he does still kind of have this kind of like artificial, you know, Corona around him. And that, that, that thing you said, you know, the idea that, oh, it was understandable, you know, burning down churches for what turned out to be a fake, you know, a fake grave. To me, that that reminds me very much of, you know, the the way that Obama talked about the BLM movement. Very, you know, almost identical. 
you might remember Barack Obama uh, famously said about, I think it was Michael Brown, he could have been my son. That's exactly what I was going to bring up. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of those things where it's like, when you've done that, you've essentially signed your name, you know, kind of implicitly to that violence, you know, to that, like just use of, you know, just, I mean, essentially like mob, you know, like mob coercion against your enemies. Yeah, that's right. And, and to me, I think that's one been kind of like the interesting thing to see developed over the last, you know, 15 years in North America is this, 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 this kind of like a narco tyranny as Sam Francis would describe it, where on one hand, there's the very, you know, the very real tyranny, you know, like the FBI might show up at your door, you know, if you, if you block the road at an abortion protest, you know, they might, you know, freeze your bank. But on the other hand, there's this kind of willingness to kind of allow these kind of like collection of misfits to just enact violence against the state, pe- the, against the people the state wants to hurt, you know, yeah. just not directly. So I'm curious, and I'm, I'm, I'll be the first to admit, I, I just don't follow Canadian news very closely. But is there kind of a similar, like, version of like the Antifa class in the U.S.? Well, it, it's a little bit different here in that uh, they're the shock troops of the Laurentian elite, and there's a whole other set of fro- shock troops for each of the the other the other two elites that dominate the country. So there's the the Franco-Canadian elite, and they have their set of shock troops. You know, very famously, these are the people that took to the streets and like burned down Montreal because Maurice Richard got a penalty in a playoff game. Um, so they have they have their their shock troops, and the the Western Canadian elite uh, have their own techniques. And so you're in Canada. You're not looking at the same situation where all the institutional where like red America and blue America live right on top of each other. So it's very easy for them to enact violence upon one another. Uh, very easy for a narco tyranny to, to operate in Canada. These nations live more separate lives. So it's much more difficult to, uh, for a narco tyranny to be sort of practiced in, in it, in its classical form. So of those hundred churches that were, vi- that were vandalized, uh, during the, uh, during the protests related to, uh, residential schools, um, most of those churches were kind of disused. So they were enacting violence at the old culture of Canada rather than something that was active and alive. Hmm. No, that's an interesting thing you bring up because it is almost an, an, an incredibly like performative version of violence. You know, it's like you're enacting violence. It's very much like what happened in the U.S. with the, the Confederate statues. Yeah, you know, that's there right. A, there's there's no one left. There are no troops left to defend the Confederate statues. And now is the time to pull them down. Right. Exactly. Yes. Whereas if you tried to do that in, I don't know, 1950, there would have been people who would have stood up and and said, no, these are our heroes. And in a very similar way, most of the places where uh, progressives enact violence in Canada are places that they've already conquered. That is an interesting dynamic because uh, you you kind of, on one hand, obviously the summer of love was incredibly destructive, but there was also that aspect of it to, obviously I feel, you know, a great deal of sympathy for the small businessmen, you know, who got their lives ruined by those riots, you know, for people who lost their lives, you know, but in general, right. It was, you know, lefties in Portland smashing up Portland. Yeah. You know, it's almost very much this kind of like, well, I'm going to break my toys if I don't get what I want. And obviously it's dis- it's destructive and it's scary, but I don't, I, I think there's a, there's a trend in our circles to kind of catastrophize and look like obviously large scale political violence can and does occur. Like even in my relatively small town, you know, during the, you know, the, especially, uh, you know, fiery, but peaceful days of 2020, like even my town got, you know, we had a full, you know, curfew, I, I basically got stuck out, you know, behind the police line had to be escorted through like it was, it was, you know, very much real. But it, there is also something to the fact that, you know, a lot of these people a lot of like the shock troops, 
you know, especially like the more politically active ones, less like the opportunistic ones. They're not particularly competent or capable people. You know, like we shouldn't confuse these with, with like the Bolsheviks. You know, they're kind of embarrassing. They're kind of playing pretend as revolutionaries. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's a complicated thing because whenever you see mass political violence in history, it's it has precursors. And the precursors are these kinds of trial massacres where you don't expect to be re resisted. And you do that before you execute massacres that are directed toward actual actual defended targets, right? So before you go and attack actual red American towns, you go and tear down the statue from the time when red Americans used to live in your town. So it's not correct to ignore it as if it's like, as if they're just breaking their own toys. It's not correct to catastrophize it as if, um, as if it's an immediate and present danger to, you know, any American, it's it's somewhere between that on the spectrum. I think that's well said. I take your point. Uh, so anyway, sorry, going back to what we were talking about about earlier, I'm curious because if I'm if I'm correct, there's not a particularly large, you know black population in Canada, at least compared to the US. Was there, other than obviously what happened with the residential schools, was there kind of a, an echo of the BLM movement there? There was an echo of the BLM movement here. It's profoundly ridiculous because there were basically no African people in Canada before about 1980. So uh, when I was a, a, a student at school, there was a, there was a, a grant put up to write a history of black, of Africans in Canada uh, in like the 19th century. And the, the gentleman who wrote the paper had this terrible struggle because he had to actually find black Americans in the 19th century in Canada. Um, and what he ended up writing on was sleeping car porters on the trans Canadian railroad because they were the only black Americans or black Canadians he could find at the time. Um, were the, these like, uh, people who worked on the, or, as like waiters on the sleeping car, car cars so there's this project in canada to try to you, you have to import the diversity before you can then create before you can then properly use the racism and and not have it look ridiculous i was about to say i think that the term like black canadians is really only technically plural you know like you really have to look <laughs> for the second guy <laughs> well but it, that's not true anymore. It used to be right, true. of course, post post nineteen eighty. Right. So, post nineteen eighty, a lot of African people came here, mostly from the United States. Now, a huge number of people from Sub-Saharan Africa come here. Um, but so we we now have domestic large domestic populations of African people, but there's no comparable history to the history that exists in the United States. Like all of these people came here after the civil rights era. Um, you know, they've only ever experienced affirmative action. They never experienced uh, direct discrimination, right? So, I mean, it's weird to have affirmative action without having had the, the prior period of discrimination, but we do. So, you know, there it is. So I, I'm curious, obviously there are kind of problems that are affecting you know, like the wider Western world, but what are kind of like the unique challenges Canada is facing and you kind of expect it to face over the next couple of years? Well, I actually am fairly optimistic about Canada relative to the broader West. And the reason I'm fairly optimistic about Canada relative to the broader West is because our central government is much weaker and has spent much more of its capital than the broader West. Um, so, you can kind of imagine Canada, if there's a spectrum between the United States where the central government is still very strong and South Africa where the central government is kind of a joke, Canada is closer to the South Africa end of the spectrum than it is to the United States end of the spectrum. They don't have a, a big police force. They don't have an, a big army. They don't have, um, you know, unlimited capital. Uh, and so it is much harder for them to crack down on on people who want to do different things so that th there's that 
aspect to it on the one hand. On the other hand, um, Canadians themselves um, have gone through this process of modernity earlier than all the, than other Western peoples. And so when I look at the broader dissident right, I, I actually see a, a, a profound epistemic divide between those, those people who are still holding on to a culture that hasn't yet been destroyed by modernity and those people who are kind of on the other side of modernity destroying their culture who are trying to construct something new. And so in Canada, the only people who kind of make any sense are people who are on the other side of modernity because the Canada that you might hearken back to prior to modernity, there's so little of it left, it would be a joke to try to defend it. You really have to be thinking about building something new and you're building something new in, a, in an environment where, I mean, yeah, sure, everybody's like rapidly progressive and uh, they might enact political violence and there's going to be like uh, expro expropriative taxation against you. But on the other hand, the tools that the state has to, to wield against you are a lot weaker than they would be in, say, the United States or Britain, um, where the central government is still kind of intact and, and semi-competent. Well, this is actually one of the things that I think about quite often is that, it, that really one of the major disadvantages, because, okay, I'll, I'll start off with saying if I had to pick whoever's the most screwed, it's the UK. Like they're, they're, they're kind of at the worst of, you know, like multiple axes of, you know, kind of like upcoming hardship. But I think one of the things that the US has is an amazing disadvantage, especially for us as, as dissidents, is we have this incredibly strong intelligence apparatus. And not only that, it's still like competent. The effects of uh, the effects of equity-driven hiring have not rendered your federal bureaucracy so incompetent that it's impotent. Right. Exactly. And look, like who knows? Maybe it's coming. You know, I think that uh, the a lot of people have kind of been, you know, preparing for the you know the Brazilification of America. You know, it's becoming the nicest third world country in the world. Yeah. But. And so I very much see what you're getting at. I think one of the other advantages that Canada has is that it's, as far as I understand, it's not particularly overpopulated. Like there's a no, lot it's, of states. It's, it's the second largest country in the world by land area, and there's 40 million people living here. So you could give away like 70, 80% of Canada's land mass, and the, you, you would still not, and concentrate the 40 million people in the remaining 20%, you would still be less dense than most of the U.S., now, to be perfectly fair, the top, you know, 50% of the country is essentially a frost blasted hellscape. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there is that. I, I, admittedly, coming from an American Southerner who considers yeah. below freezing, you know, un unreasonably cold. So I realize I'm a little biased. But I think one of the other things that, and this is, I think, helpful across like the brighter, the broader, like, like North American continents, we just do have a lot of natural resources. Now, it's frustrating. And I think that you know, in the U.S., we've seen this this feeling of almost like drowning in a bathtub, where we have these, these massive untapped resources essentially just sitting there right. that for a variety of reasons we won't access. And obviously, the the Keystone Pipeline has been you know big in the news with you know kind of like rising fuel. But it, it operates across all kinds of dimensions. For some stupid reason, most American food is grown in California. There's there's no sense in which that. There's no logical reason for that. You know, the, the farmland in, in Virginia is very good, but when you drive through like rural Virginia, you don't find lots of prosperous, active commercial farms. You find like fields that were once farmed and are kind of overgrown now. No, it's, uh, it's you're, you're completely right. And I think that you've, and this is one of the things that I constantly think about is that are we at kind of the past the point of diminishing returns as far as kind of like global complexity goes, you know, are, are we past the point really of, you know, importing things really making sense and maybe, you know, rising energy costs are the things that kind of, you know, defeats globalism. You know, if you can't, if you can't move things cheaply, well, it becomes, this is dumb to say, you know, but stating it in like a syllogistic way, it becomes, well, less cheap to move things. And that, you know, changes. The, it you creates know, a comparative costing. advantage for locals. Exactly. And you've seen very much the, the the damage done by that. So I've been I've been reading one of my favorite favorite authors is is Wendell Berry, 
And, you know, a lot of his, you know, novels center around, you know, a small town in Tennessee, and he kind of follows, you know, a series of different family lines and not important, just a little bit of background, but they all take place, you know, roughly in the same time, essentially small town, you know, rural America from, you know, roughly 1900 to, you know, the mid seventies, essentially, you know, the time he and his parents lived in. And you see this transition from the example used in the book is, is eggs, right? Where it was before where eggs were kind of a, a, a good that many people bought and sold. You know, it was pretty common that if you were poor, you know, you'd have a couple chickens and you would sell the extra at the store yeah. in town. You know, it was a good way to make, you know, spare money in a time when hard cash was, you know, was hard to come by. And there's this great line in it when he's, when he's basically talking about the transition of when, you know, like the big box stores came in. And he says, you know, like, and everyone was talking about how you could buy, you know, three dozen eggs for a nickel and no one stopped to ask, well, where was the nickel going and how good were the eggs? Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of this like pithy little statement, but I, I think that when I look at a, a global economy, which is uh, to put it mildly looking a little shaky, you know, like there's a lot of uncertainty going around. Yeah. Well, obviously like there's a whole lot of, I guess, discomfort between, you know, a globalized supply chain and well, now everyone on a local level is to some degree, you know, providing for their own nourishment, right? Like there's, that's a, that's an uncomfortable shift. You know, a lot of bad yeah. things happen with that, but it's at least just like a mathematical possibility. You know, you well, could... I don't think you start to see this dynamic assert itself unless you see the political forces that are aligned. So what you're outlining here is first of all, that the source of the source of capital that, that drove this, this political alignment is drying up the the economic justification for empire is decreasing and that's been true for quite a while um and, and you can see this across all kinds of dimensions you talked about the price of fuel but like when was the last time that the that a u.s military adventure was really commercially successful for the american elite um I'd find a hard, I'd have a hard time putting a pin on it, but I don't think it's happened in a while. I mean, it depends how granular you want to be. Like, if you want to say like, oh yeah, we, we kicked around, you know, Granada, we, 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 you know, found some tiny little country and, you know, shook them down for their lunch money, maybe, but yeah. on a grand scale, I would agree with you. Well, I mean, let's put it this way. If the Iraq war was a project to conquer Iraq and steal their oil, it failed miserably. It was much more expensive, every metric, yeah. Right. So the the conspiracy theory when I was you know a teenager about Iraq was that you know this was all about oil. Well, if it was all about oil, they did a really bad job of uh, of, of what they were trying to do, right? Yeah, we 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 we, we burned a whole <laughs> lot of oil and got almost nothing back. Yes, and, and you see this pattern. I I think Moldbug referred to it as you know the dog chasing the car, right? Uh, and the U S has been a really strong dog that catches the car every time, but you know, it's a car. <laughs> um, and so there's that dynamic going on, but as long as that, that dog is big and strong, it's going to be really, really hard to, to stop that behavior. So this, I'm not very, uh, bullish on deglobalization occurring as long as the U.S. military is a standing fighting force, as long as the CIA is a standing, a standing entity. I do think it will be the case that uh, places at the periphery of the empire, or however you want to define that, will begin to fall off and fall into localism, and I think you're already starting to see that happen. But and I sh I should say I, I I completely agree with your analysis there. I, I wasn't saying this as a as a thing that will happen, you know, soon, like an eminent event. I was just trying to make the point that if we assume that over enough time, this will happen, you know, that, that eventually deglobalization is happening. I look at places like America and Canada and I, I say like, look, like things might get unpleasant, but that is a, that is a survivable future. Well, Whereas, oh, sorry. and not only that in places like America and Canada, you've got so much capital to burn through that you know, if things get got bad here, um, things would have to get, things would get so much worse for everybody else before they got bad for us that you would have to, uh, Matt, like if you, if you wanted to be somewhere, you'd want to be here. 
And then that's well said. I, I think that it is kind of this a constant temptation to just like, like Cassandra, you know, like the world is, <laughs> the world is ending, you know, it's all falling apart. And it, it brings me to a, you know, a frustration I have. And I'm not even sure who the frustration is directed at, but so growing up in, you know, in kind of like red American circles during the Obama era, you know, there was this, like this continuous, I guess, like doom and gloom, you know, like we've spent too much money, you know, like the national debt. Like I remember that there, there's a, like a tiny little, you know, small town bank near my, where my house was. And the, the business owner was so, so pissed off by Obama that he installed a digital sign, like this yeah. massive sign out in front that had a live debt tracker. Yeah. And yeah, so, there used to be one of those whenever you went into Manhattan as well, like on a I giant billboard. But this is I, obviously, I, I assume it was, you know, a broader trend. I, I was probably yeah. eight or nine years old at the time, right? <laughs> so not exactly, you know, like with my finger on the pulse of society. But I, I do remember this kind of feeling that, you know, it was always coming. You know, the big one was coming. <laughs> yeah. And it was all going to be, you know, Mad Max. And look, like, obviously, like, ideas do have consequences. Eventually, you do have to fess up to it. But there is this kind of, I guess, there's a weird hubris in it, you know, that we are the last generation. You know, it's like, this is the the most interesting it could ever get. And then it's all just going to kind of explode. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So uh, there's a, uh, I forget who I'm quoting here, but there's a, a statement. There's a lot of ruin in the nation. And I think is I believe, or at least, like, I think I so. Yes, and, and, and I think it, it's broadly true about the economic situation in the West, right? We're some of the richest people who have ever existed. We could get a lot poorer before being poor was our problem, right? That said, I think the the cultural concerns are like orders of magnitude more threatening than economic concerns so if if i were to kind of speak as a canadian here um the biosecurity state the uh progressive religious views on gender are just like their orders of magnitude more threatening to me personally and more threatening to my posterity than the economic damage that might be uh, might be wreaked on the nation, and I I expect things to get bad economically. But if I'm poor and my children are poor, you know, okay, I, I can live with that. Um, but from the point of view of threatening a people, um, you know, th the English Canadian people have already taken huge steps towards self-extinguishment um, just as a consequence of sort of 1980s feminism and its views about children. Um, we're on the precipice of self-annihilation um, as, a, as a people group and inflicting that self-annihilation on, on people who don't really want to go along with it either. Um, so, you know, I, I talk about economics a lot on, on Radlib's show. It, it's interesting, but I think my grievances against our progressive overlords are not primarily economic. And I think anybody who centers economic concerns is at the top of their list of grievances against the progressives has a misperception of how rich uh, they actually are. That's, that's well said. You you bring up a lot of, you know, interesting points there. So I, again, and I'm not trying to just, you know, bombard you with things I remember about Canada, <laughs> but there's been kind of a dialogue going on recently about, you know, physician assisted suicide, you know, essentially yep. being, you know, euthanized by, you know, government doctors and, and someone, and I can't remember who on, you know, Twitter or Telegram, you know, wrote this kind of chilling post where they basically said like, look, like, if you don't think, you know, the same percentage of, you know, of unhappy young girls, of you know, kind of like weird, you know, young boys who are, you know, going through gender reassignment now, 
If you think those same people won't just be killing themselves in 10 years, you're dead wrong. And I realized that there's the Oren, the Oren McIntyre line, you know, the, the slippery slope is the undefeated champion of the 21st century. Yeah. That it really is something that kind of like put a chill in me to a certain degree, which is not really easy to do anymore. You know, yeah. I mean, this is something I don't, know how to think about because a lot of young people who are adopting trans identities are adopting trans identities as a means of, of grabbing status you can't grab status by committing suicide um so i don't think uh medically assisted suicide associated with me mental illness will have the same kind of mimetic property that gender transition does that said, Canada went from euthanasia for like late stage cancer patients to euthanasia for anyone too poor to pay for their own hospice space and or like too mentally ill to want to live in the space of like four years. So I think it would be very early for me to, to conclude that it's not a threat to get to become a more broad social problem. Uh, no, I, that's, that's well said. And I think that caution, you know, is warranted that <laughs> it's much harder to, it, there is no, you can't clout chase with it. right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't once, but it is very much like a, you know, it doesn't really pay dividends in the same way that, uh, you know, uh, permanently ending your, uh, you know, your genetic line does. So anyway, I really appreciated talking to you, Black Horse, but we're, we're kind of coming up on time. Is there anything you want to address before we wrap this up? Um, I mean, what's the thread that ties this interview together? Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I will say like that this is that there is a thread, at least that I see that kind of that, you know, like, well, there certainly are you know, bad things going on in the world, right? Like they're not all necessarily quite as bad as they seem, you know, like, I don't think that the sun is going to explode and we'll be, you know, simultaneously plunged into like the, you know, the 10,000 year Fetter Reich or whatever, like we'll, we'll be okay, at least to some degree. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say that uh, there are strategies available uh, to navigate this particular uh, version of the zombie apocalypse. Um, but that it, I mean, I, I talk to this with some of my friends online quite frequently. We're coming up on this incredible genetic bottleneck where if you want your family, your people um, to have a future on the other side of this event horizon, whatever it is, you really have to take some fairly dramatic steps right now. Um, and you can see this in Canada already. Like if I look at my own family, almost all the descendants of my great grandparents are rendered through like one genetic line. Um, and that's a direct con. The reason all their great grandchildren are rendered through like one genetic line is as a consequence of these kind of mind viruses that destroy fertility. And I think you have to really seriously reckon with um, the fact that a lot of these uh, social contagions are, you know, quite deadly and you need to operate accordingly. That's well said. And that it does kind of bring up an interesting point just in the fact that, uh, and obviously the, the, the danger in this is that much like you said earlier, like progressives, reproduce, you know, essentially by ensnaring, you know, their enemies' children. You know, so it's not a it's not a guaranteed, you know, get out of get out of jail free card. But it is odd because the rate at which people are destroying their ability to reproduce. You know, whereas before it was just we never got around to having kids. You know, we between you know contraception and abortion, you know, it just never happened. Or maybe you got around to having one kid. Right, exactly. You know, it was a it was a choice that you could make. There's there's this chilling podcast that my uh, my fiance has been listening to, 
and it, it, she's obviously kind of hate watching it or hate listening yeah. to it. And it, it follows the story of two women freezing their eggs, like going through with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it, it's grim. Like, I mean that sincerely, like it yeah. is, I, I, I don't have the stomach for it, but nonetheless, like all of these trends that we see, you know, elective self sterilization, either, you know, to, to fight the chuds or through, you know, these kind of like elective gender surgeries, you know, people waiting, at least, you know, like blue staters waiting later and later, like that, that has an effect. And look like uh, just by virtue of how population dynamics work, it, not to say that, you know, you automatically win, but, you know, these people are, you know, kind of poisoning themselves, you know, poisoning their, their, their lineage. And they're betting on the fact that they can create ideological children, right? They can use the apparatus of education. They can essentially import new children. Right. But everything that we know about, genetics tells us that that's not the case exactly they've they've made a they made a bad bet and that doesn't mean that everything is going to be fine you know everything's going to be no perfect. in fact the last time an elite made a bad bet of this kind that i'm aware of is when the roman elite made a bad bet on uh roman citizenship and over the course of 100 years that went really badly right um so <laughs> The fact that I, I believe the demise of the progressive order on a generational timescale is inevitable, you know, by no means means that we're going to escape it. Like the, the, the women that you're following in this podcast that froze their eggs are going to do an incredible amount of damage on their way out, right? And nobody should underestimate the consequences of that, nor should they anticipate that what follows this era will be you know magically good uh in fact i i don't have you know my broad frame on on what's happening in the west is is the west is under the judgment of god for its sins and that's going to be horrible for everybody involved in it um i wouldn't wish it on on my worst enemies and yet it is going to be inflicted on us and we're going to have to live through it having said that there is a there's a remnant there that that can have a, a hope and a future that hasn't bent their knee to bail um, and may live on afterwards. And I think that that is if we're looking at and I realize we're in kind of different you know stages in life here. you know I, you know from the little bit I know about it, you know about your life, it seems to a certain degree you know kind of aspirational to guys my age. And I, I think that having that that vision of the fact that like look like, judgment is coming you know if, if it's not here yet it's going to come but nonetheless like that there's kind of a there's an opportunity in that to a certain degree and there's also a like a definite path forward well and and I, I think, think the opportunity that, is greatest in places where you know you see this opportunity in south africa right now you're going to see it emerge in many places presently dominated by the west that as the progressives poison themselves you know there there are going to be places where you can create a perfectly good life and community for yourself and it's not obvious where yet but there will be places i completely agree and and i think that that obviously the idea of you know that cycle of you know good men create hard times and so on has kind of been it's kind of been memed but I think that we need to kind of like look around and be like, well, okay, like hard times are coming. Like, are we the hard men? You know, maybe some of us are. I'm, you know, maybe less convinced in my own case, but, <laughs> and I mean that sincerely, you yeah. know, like I, I'm not trying to be like self-flattering about it. I just mean like, uh, like I look at myself and I'm not the kind of man that, you know, remakes an empire, yeah. but nonetheless, like there is this kind of call to preserve you know, like preserve what was kind of like good and, and beautiful. And in many ways that can be, you know, like literal, you know, like it's why I'm so big on having, you know, physical copies of books, but also like the, that kind of like process of like paving the way. And I guess like preparing a, you know, kind of like the next generation in obviously like an edu like a way that 
that leaves them ready for the world they're going to encounter. You know, I think is a really, I guess like that is kind of a, that is a noble calling and that is something to aspire to. And I think that if we can say that the, the crisis of the West post cold war or really post world war two has been, you know, a crisis of meaning, you know, and we almost saw that like we had all this ease, we had all this comfort, we had all this pleasure. And at the end of it, we're sitting there and the comfort's going away. Yeah, we're all Sam Bankman freed, right? Exactly. Uh, but <laughs> at least we might have meaning again. Yeah. And I don't mean to say on an individual level, but I think that it's easy to feel the loss of physical comfort. Like, look, like I, I'm addicted to creature comforts as much as the next guy. Yeah. But there is something to be said for, well, maybe when that goes away, we'll. <laughs> well, there's we'll a reality that, 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 I mean, Sam Bank Bankman freed is deeply instructive in this case because there's a reality in which I feel pity for him. He, he's lived a disgusting and useless life. Oh, no, I, I actually completely agree. Like, he, he gives me, and this is a stupid way to describe it, but like, he gives me the Gollum feeling. Yeah. You know, it's like you're both completely despicable and I hate you and I also feel bad for you. Yeah, I don't mean hate in the most, I meant that in a colloquial sense, of course, but. Yeah, yeah I mean, I might not mean that in a colloquial sense. I mean, I mean you're looking at evil incarnate. That's but I, Look, I'm just feeling good because I, I saw someone. I got saved by Telegram. Some anon on Telegram said, "Hey, pull everything out from FTX." I pulled everything I had out from FTX. You know, so did all my <laughs> friends. And then, essentially, like twelve hours later, the whole oh, thing went up goodness. in smoke. So, look, yeah. I, I'm not feeling too bad about it, but I realize that's just pure dumb luck, you know. Yeah, I mean that. That's in my mind, that's one of the least of his crimes. His his oh, donation yeah. record, in my mind, is his his list of offenses. Um, but there's a real there but for the grace of god go i kind of feeling right um well i actually i know exactly what you mean that there is this kind of it is a little bit scary in a weird way that you're like oh i didn't know like i didn't really know some like i, I guess this is stupid to say but like i didn't know someone could end up like this you know someone yeah. who like from the start you know seemed to have it all made you know, like, oh, this guy's, you know, smart, he's well connected, you know, he's he's got all this backing, and you know, what did you do with it? And and there's maybe a broader conversation to be had there about about you know human nature and kind of like I guess our, our capacity for sin. And when I say like I'm not surprised, look, like I know people are are like know, people that, are yeah. evil, but when you see it so clearly, it is a little bit and it's not just like if you look his this is evil in the way that certain Roman Empire emperors were evil, right? It's this kind of um, the conquest of the lusts of the body over any kind of higher calling. Um, right, right, like that 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 clip of him, you know, on, on a on a call, you know, where they're literally throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at him, you know, and he can't be bothered to stop playing League of Legends for 10 minutes. Yeah, you know, it's just like but he's this such is a, man, a slave. This is a man who's not free, right? Um, one of the things that I think is really brilliant about the Carlylean sort of great man framework is implicitly by uh, framing great men as having a kind of heroic will, it reminds us that most men have something like no will. Um. And, and you know, there you see this in in modern memeing with the MP, the NPC meme, and there's all kinds of variations of it. But increasingly, as I observe the world around me, I'm convinced that like the overwhelming majority of people are not capable of these kinds of higher order decision make decisions and shaping their life as a consequence of it. It's an enormous challenge, and I think. You know, this guy who's sitting on whatever it is, $10 billion, can't remake his life into something healthy. Um, can't secure a legacy for himself. Can't do any of these things. Instead has to sink to stealing client funds in order to, I guess, donate more to Democrats or something. Like, what's the point of stealing cl client funds when you're a billionaire? Um, and a billionaire who, like, has no direction in life to, to do anything with them. Well, there is something just kind of 
pathetic about the fact that, it, it, you know, at least if he had if he had stolen it all, you know, he'd raided the company coffers and was like living it up. You know, like he was drinking the finest wine. You know, he had a, you know, a, a thousand foot yacht. Like that's not morally good, but it's it's almost more human and more understandable than just this like like autistic freak, you know, who had, you know, g- given essentially unlimited resources. He seems to have, you know, had a gross poly relationship, played lots of video games, eaten gross food, and then just given it all back to the system that gave him money in the first place. Well, and it turns out you could have done that without the without the billion dollars, right? I mean, it's not a free lifestyle, but it's not an expensive one. Right, exactly. Like there are plenty of like gross Reddit leftists who essentially do the exact same thing and don't have to steal any money to do it, or at least yeah. directly. Well, and he didn't have to steal anybody to do it. He had plenty of legitimately raised money. <laughs> like yeah, exactly. it, in his initial Silicon Valley ra- round, there was a more than a billion dollars. I guarantee you that with a billion dollars, he could have lived that way the rest of his life. Oh yeah, he could have lived. Uh, dozens of him could have lived that life <laughs> on a billion dollars. Like. Yeah, I, that, that's that's an interesting story to me, both just from a, you know, like a, a news aspect and also just from like the, there's kind of a fascinating version of human nature in that. Well, I think I it think. highlights the, the genetic bottleneck of modernity in this incredibly profound way, right? Where the capacity to create, the capacity to create and adopt purpose is the difference between living and dying at the generational level. So Sam Bankman fried regardless of his, inherited advantages both physical and uh in terms of his social position will not replicate himself in the following generation and it will be a consequence of his susceptibility to lack of purpose i also wonder if there's another part in addition to the you know the ability to create purpose i also wonder how much you know your genetic ability to kind of resist the the like the the different like dopamine, I guess, like dopamine machines our society makes, you yeah. know, the ability to just turn yourself into a, like a, you know, like a pleasure machine, you know, whether that's, you know, social media, video games, you know, like we kind of poly like, relationship. Yeah, exactly. Like, I wonder how much that ability to kind of, you know, control yourself will determine how much you reproduce just because like, and, and you see this right with some of my, you know, some of my older friends who are in their kind of like late twenties to early thirties. And a lot of them as millennials, it's and kind of like older Gen Z, it's kind of disturbing to listen to how they talk about children and look like I, I get it. Right. Like there's a, there's a type of, there's a person who is not called to a family, right? Like I'm not trying to get into that debate, but nonetheless, when someone kind of primarily frames a family as a, you know, a, a imposition on their like personal set of you know, hobbies and consumer yeah, hedonic habits. maximization. Yeah, exactly. Like you get to a certain point where it's like, wait a minute, like, is this the whole point? You know, like is living as like an atomized individual at, you know, you're, you're kind of like indeterminate age in a big city, you know, where you work a lot, you know, get Uber eats well, th- and that's watch right. Netflix. Like the is genetic, this the point of it? The genetic bottleneck is, is the ability to say no to the pod, right? Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. It, it's like the ability to, it, I guess it really is like we're we're seeing the <laughs> that we're we're seeing delayed gratification become a prerequisite for reproduction almost. Well, but it's not even delayed gratification; it's defining gratification in a in a way that has some kind of sense, right? Because you could delay your gratification and maximize, you know, have your tricked out extra great pod. Mm, no, that's fair. Fair point. Um, there's something deeper and more more profound here and i think there's an incredible sense of there's an incredible sense of cosmic justice to the idea that the most materialistic generation of all time is going to be judged by being swallowed up by their material possessions as the things they make begin to control them no that's well said It, it 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 is very much like this and I guess it is kind of like the classic, I guess, like relationship with sin, you know, that in any form it does, 
at a certain point, like it does control you, you know? And I think that this is the, you know, the important difference between what we can consider like, you know, liberal freedom and ancient freedom, you know, that like, well, is freedom this kind of, you know, like true, you know, self mastery and kind of like discipline and, you know, self rule. Or is freedom essentially the ability to gratify yourself in whatever way you you desire? You know, and in very much like, you know, Plato's dialogues with Gorgias, I, I feel like we, it, you know, instead of just scratching ourselves or, you know, paying a slave to scratch our, you know, our, our open wounds, right? It's, <laughs> we've almost developed, you know, a, an endless number of, you know, pitfalls that can essentially just rule you. Like it's never been easier to get addicted to, you know, half a dozen different things. And yep. so in very much like the same way that, and look, like I don't really remember the pre-internet world, but if you watch old ads, you know, for personal computers, you know, like the, it's very much this idea of like, this kind of like character of night, caricature of nineties optimism. Like, oh, you can surf the web. You can, you know, you can check your emails and look like, even if you're not addicted to your computer now, well, what has it enabled you to do? Well, now your boss can reach you anywhere. You know, like you get emails everywhere. You know, you're, you're constantly bound to, you know, scheduling and timing wherever because you always have it with you. And even in a non-addictive sense, it's like these things really do kind of start to control us. And obviously to more or less pernicious ends, but it is an interesting dynamic. Well, Are you still there, Black Horse? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm still here. I'm just wondering how to wrap this. <laughs> well, look, I'll put it this way. It's quite a, it's quite an achievement. You got me to go over an hour, which I, I am very loath to do. I try to keep it to a, you know, a nice, like tight and, uh, you know, snappy hour. It's interesting. I think only Canadians have done it. You know, both <laughs> you and Gio got me to, uh, you know, pass the hour mark. Yeah. Well, Gio and I are very different kinds of Canadians, but he's, oh, a, he's an interesting guy. And look like that, that was, I was, even as I said that, I was like, they're not, I can't think of two more dissimilar people <laughs> on this side of things. <laughs> Again, like nothing but love to you and Gio, right? But it is yeah. just funny to observe. But I realize that is a kind of a difficult thing to wrap up. And you know, I'm not quite sure how to tie that in a bow. Well, I, I mean, I think what the thread that ties this together is that there, there are a set of presuppositional choices that you're going to have to make if you're going to make it through modernity and you better start looking now because you know the the death is all around you um and choosing right doesn't guarantee that you'll make it but choosing wrong certainly guarantees that you won't make it that's well said black horse thank you for uh i mean i mean both your wisdom and just you know finding some way to you know to wrap up that conversation so before we get out of here, Black Horse, is there anything you want to show? Uh, no, I, I don't. Well, go and check out my streams with Radlib. Uh, I don't have a channel of my own. I mean, you can check out my Twitter, but I, I don't do this for money. I, I do this uh, because I'd like my children to have a future. Well, I do do this for money as a, as a <laughs> flagrant sellout. Uh, anyway, guys, I will have, you know, I have Black Horse's links down in the description. I'll probably link the playlist of his appearance on Radlib as well as his Twitter account, both of which I you know, wholeheartedly endorse. Uh, this show obviously is available on YouTube, but also as an audio only version on Apple, Spotify, you know, anywhere you listen to, to podcasts normally. And I have a bit of a scheme set up where the most recent 10 episodes are always free as an audio only version. And after that, they do go behind a paywall at my Substack, And that's just a way to kind of cover the cost of the streaming platform and, you know, releasing it as an audio show. It's not crazy expensive, but you know, every little bit helps. And obviously they will always be free, you know, my entire backlog on my YouTube. So long as I'm on YouTube, uh, no new guests planned at least for this week, but we should have some you know, good episodes coming up next week and, uh, looking out, looking forward to, you know, putting out some more content for you guys. And uh, I, oh, one more thing, if I can just ask one thing, if you guys could uh, just rate the podcast, you know, whatever rating you think it's worth on those podcast platforms, I do appreciate it because I think my days on, on YouTube are numbered and I'd like to have <laughs> numbers elsewhere. I've been trying to be good and I've not been succeeding. I'll put it that way. Yeah, there you uh, go. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for coming out. And again, thank you, Black Horse, for coming on the show. And uh, remember, everyone, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night. <laughs>